So this is the chapter on motivation, how we motivate employees. And in this segment, we're going to talk about job design as well as goals and goal setting theory. So typically when we talk about motivation, we think about the person. Is he or she motivated? And we have theories stemming from a person's need, how a person thinks about the situation, emotional reactions, uh, and subsequent behaviors. Now we're going to flip it around a little bit and we're going to look at the situation that the person is in. So an employee in his or her environment, are they perceiving that environment, their job, their tasks, the way we are setting goals and communicating with them? Are they perceiving that to be motivational? So we are switching focus from the employee, him or herself, to the situation, the environment they're in, and we're going to start with job design. So job design basically just deals with the way we set up the job, how are tasks, actions, projects, duties divided among all of the employees within the organization. Do we have a lot of specialization? Do people do one thing over and over? Or do we have broad generalizations where people are more of a generalist, where they do a little bit of everything? So there's different ways of putting tasks, projects, duties together. And some of those ways tend to be more motivational than other ways. So that's the basic gist of job design and job design theory in driving motivation. So starting many decades ago, Frederick Taylor, we um, seem to encounter this man's name uh, frequently when we talk about management. He is uh, considered to be the father, one of the fathers of scientific management. He was an industrial engineer and he was looking at efficiencies. So how can we make an organization more efficient, meaning we are using resources more wisely to get more output with reduced input. So that's the basic idea behind efficiencies. So Frederick Taylor proposed to minimize waste in organizations by identifying the best ways to do a job. So we call this job specialization. Um, that is the term, the terminology that comes um, with scientific management. And the basic idea here is that we are breaking down jobs into very specific tasks. And the tasks are being broken down into very simple components. And then each employee just get a sliver or a small piece of that task or of that um, job. And so each person just do one thing over and over again. So from an organizational perspective, it's very efficient. Um, it literally just takes two minutes to hire somebody into a role where they're just going to do one task over and over. It takes another two minutes to train them. I'm being a little facetious, but that was the general idea, is that it's very simple and people can do learn the jobs and um, execute on the jobs very quickly and efficiently. Of course, it's boring, right? So when we just do one thing over and over, most of us, not everyone, but most of us are going to find that extremely boring. So the outcomes that are associated with job specialization is poor motivation, boring, repetitive, and so people tend to be absent from their jobs. So instead of job specialization, we can do things that are a little bit more motivational for people, for employees. And so we have a few here on the left side. They're called job rotation, job enlargement, and job enrichment. And then on the right side of the screen, you see the job characteristics model. And we're going to talk more about that one uh, on the next slide. But the job characteristics model is basically a theory that tells us why it is more motivational to do more things rather than fewer things in a job. So job rotation. So, so basically that's the gist, right? So doing more things is more motivational than doing fewer or one thing only, using one skill only, one task only. So job rotation, enlargement, and enrich enrichment are ways where we broaden the job in different ways. Job rotation broadens a person's exposures, exposure, <laughs> exposures well, to different tasks by moving them around. So job rotation moves employees from job to job at regular intervals. So you get a hired on with Walmart or Target, 
uh, as a uh, first line manager or mid-level manager and they're going to rotate you through being a cashier and stocking the shelves and uh, working in the back office to HR so that you get an overall sense of the organization. That approach is called job rotation. You stay in one role uh, for a little bit of time so you're going to pick up a lot more of the strategy of the organization, understand how the organization works, plus it's going to be a lot more fun. The second one is job enlargement. So in job enlargement, we have a horizontal, we call that a horizontal, um, horizontal uh, broadening of the job, meaning you have jobs at the same level, so flat level, so you, they are not more difficult or more uh, empowering or more authoritarian or more uh, decision making in them, they are just more of the same. Um, so you might be a cashier at a grocery store and you might also work the deli desk and you might also uh, stock the shelves. So all of those are at the same level of job duties. So we are taking multiple similar tasks and putting them together. Then we have job enrichment, which is a vertical, vertical enlargement of the job or vertical enrichment of the job in this, instead of going horizontal we now go top to bottom or bottom to top so it's vertical so you're moving from your job over here and you're getting some more responsibility some more decision making authority over here maybe at the manager level so we are giving you more control over how you perform your task so that should be more motivational because we now have more autonomy more control more decision making power then we also have a concept called job crafting. Whoops, job crafting. Job crafting basically says that as an employee within the organization, you might see things that are not being addressed, tasks that are being undone or not done correctly or that are not being done at all. And you can actually propose to your manager or to whoever um, would have the decision-making power that this should be a job for you. And so you might actually write your own job description and we call that job crafting. So be on the lookout for things that you would like to do that is not currently being done in the organization and maybe propose for you to do those job crafting. Then we have the job characteristics model. So as I already alluded to, this is the theory behind why job rotation enlargement and enrichment should work. Job characteristics model basically says we have certain core job characteristics. There's five of them. Skill variety, task identity, task significance, autonomy, and feedback. We're going to talk about those on the next slide. Basic idea. The more you have of these five, the more you would experience these psychological states. So you would experience more meaningfulness, more responsibility, knowledge of the results of your work, actually seeing what's happening. And that is very satisfactory. So when we have that happening, we get certain outcomes with that, outcomes that are good for you and outcomes that are good for the organization. You have a higher level of motivation, hopefully a higher level of performance, doing more work or better quality work. Happiness increases, absenteeism, meaning you are not going to show up to work, reduces, and turnover. We're not going to see employees leave the company as much as before, maybe. So here are the five job characteristics. The first one is skill variety. Skill variety is the extent to which the job requires the person to use multiple skills, right? So when we talked about job speci specialization, one skill is being used typically. When you talk about job rotation or job enrichments, now you have to use a multitude of different skills. And the more skills that you get to apply on the job, the more satisfactory, motivational it is. The second one is called task identity. Task identity is the degree to which the person is in charge of completing an identifiable piece of work from start to finish. So you're working at the Ford factory and you used to build an entire car. It took you a month, but you were in charge of building that one car. 
then we move to an automated situation where we have um, everybody just doing one task. So you go from uh, building the entire car to just hanging the one wheel onto the car and that's all you do all day long. You hang a wheel, you hang the next wheel, you hang a third wheel, you hang a fourth wheel, right? So in the wheel situation, task identity is very, very low. In the building the whole car situation, the task identity is very high. Task significance, the degree to which the person's job substantially impact other people. Do you really have an impact on other people, their health, their well-being? The more impact you have, the larger, the higher the task significance is. Then we have something called autonomy. Freedom. People like freedom. We don't want to be controlled. We don't like micromanagement. The more control you have, the more freedom and decision-making you have in your job, the more empowerment, um, the higher the autonomy. Fifth is feedback. We want to know what we are going in the right direction. And if we're not going in the right direction, we need to know that. We need to get feedback so we can correct onto the right path so we can make sure that we um, execute the tasks, the projects correctly. So this is the degree to which a person learns how effective he or she is being at work. A lot of the time that feedback comes from the manager, but job um, characteristics theory also says that that must not be the case, that a lot of the time that feedback can come from the job itself. So if you work in a restaurant, maybe your customers give you that feedback, so it's not from your manager. Um, So the feedback must not always come from the manager. All right, so that was job design, and we're going to move into goal setting, which is a related theory, which basically says that if people have goals or aims for their actions, they tend to be more productive, more happy, more satisfied. So goal setting theory by Ed Locke is really acclaimed as one of the most influential and practical theories of motivation. It's really the most influential. So if you had to pick one motivational theory that says this really works, this is goal setting theory. It's always going to work better if you have goals than if you do not have goals. So studies show that setting specific time bound, right? Grab my pen. If you set specific time bound goals and you get feedback, then you have better performance. So asking somebody to do their best, never going to work. They're never going to do their best. We want to actually set SMART goals, specific, measurable, timely, realistic, and achievable. So that's SMART goals. Of course, there's a lot of downsides to goal setting, and we'll have you think of those uh, in a different venue. We're not going to do it here right now. So this is one of the really early studies, and I keep it in the PowerPoint. It's not in your textbook because it's just a really neat study. It was done um, in the 70s when goal setting, early 70s, when the goal setting uh, studies really started coming uh, into prominence. And it was um, Locke and Latham were the two authors who wrote this paper and published it in, I think, Journal of Applied Psychology. And they were basically approaching a bunch of logging uh, operations in Oregon. And they said, hey, can we just uh, set goals for your truckers? So we're not going to do anything else, but we're going to talk to the people that are hauling the logs and we're going to measure the weight of logs that they haul and we're going to give them some very specific goal. They're going to be goals. They're going to be time bound. They're going to be measurable. And then after a while, we're going to see, did they actually do better? And so um, you see the line. It's a little hard to actually read here, but it basically says on your axis here, on your x axis here, right, x-axis, um, that the y-axis, the, on your y-axis here, that the weight, right, your weight of the ho- logs hauled, uh, and then you have the months over on this axis right here, on your x-axis, that's the x-axis, axis. Uh, it's a tired, rainy uh, Tuesday here today. So, you see the dotted line here. The dotted line here is when we did not have goals. We did not have specific and hard goals. We had a do-it-your-best goal. That is not going to work. That is not a thing that's going to work for us. 
Now we set goals and what happened? Boom, we see a spike in weights hauled. A little bit of a dip, that always happens. We always have regression to the mean. It comes up again. So overall, this entire piece here are much, much higher than the do-it-your-best goals over here. So the company's accounting department basically said to get the same increase without setting the goals would have required $250,000 buying more trucks. And this is in the early 1970s. So you can think about what, how much money that would be today. So with specific hard goals, truckers were more productive. They hauled more logs. And this, is, this has been replicated in a bunch of different jobs, different companies, different organizations, different countries. Goals work. Why do actually goals work then? Goals actually give us direction. They give us direction so that we have something to work towards. Right? So we have goals that need to be aligned with company goals. And now we know in which direction we are moving. That's when we need to get feedback. So we make sure we keep moving in that direction. Goals also energize people. Because now you actually have something that you need to achieve and you know not to stop before you hit it over there. It's a challenge for you. Can you do it? So when people actually are challenged to do something, they want to show that they can do it. Goals also make us think outside the box. If you have a goal with a deadline on it and you don't know exactly how to do it, you start thinking of new strategies and outside the box for it to make it happen. So we tend to be smarter with how we're working and rethinking the way we're working. So that's going to wrap it. Here's a couple of discussion questions that I'm going to end um, with here today. I'm not assigning anything right now. This is just uh, FYI. It might come later. Um, talk to you soon. Take care.